Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Meher Roy. Today, we're speaking with David Minash, who is the co-founder and CEO of Valerie and founding member of Autonalus. And Autonalus is a funny project. It kind of, it's an AI slash blockchain crossover. And why that is interesting, uh, we'll dive into in just a second. Let us tell you before um, about our sponsors this week, though. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest years, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Hi, David. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, your background. Sure. Um, so I came to crypto from a sort of uh, background in maths and economics. I did um, maths undergrads and then uh, really uh, got into applied game theory. Um, there were some fantastic uh, courses at UCL where I did that and one thing led to another and I ended up doing a PhD there um, and then that um, you know if you fast forward quite some time uh, led for me uh, to discovering that I really like this intersection of game theory and um, machine learning which I had done a lot um, together with uh, an interest which had sort of grown steadily in crypto and blockchain. And so I'm working in that space now for over five years and particularly at this intersection of crypto and AI. Yeah, super interesting. Sounds like uh, applied economics and maths. Uh, and, and yeah, it, it, it sounds like the ideal background for getting into crypto. You, as we said in the intro, you are co-founder of Valerie, which is a cool contributor to Autonalus. Um, you co kind of co-founded with um, someone else also called David. Um, and w what kind of, what motivated you to kind of co-found this project? Kind of what's the problem you were setting out to solve? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a great question. So Valerie's mission is to basically create uh, open source software for people to co-own primarily agentic AI. Um, and we'll kind of uncover a bit what we mean by this. Um, I, I actually have two co-founders. Um, one, David Galindo, um, has a background in cryptography, um, was a cryptographer and still is. Um, and the other co-founder um, has a pseudonym called Oaksbrad Batan. He um, has a product background. And the three of us uh, really kind of um, 
in different ways, um, we're excited about autonomous agents and this general pressure which you see in um, AI towards agentic kind of AI systems. Um, and we had different experiences with this topic, different um, insights, and we came together to basically build a substrate on which you can, as groups, uh, kind of co-own these agentic AI systems. So I think that's sort of the driving force is to provide this kind of software stack which allows people to do that and also kind of create applications which people then uh, can own in that way. You've used the term agentic AI system um, quite a few times there. What is an agentic AI system? The way I think about it is that if you look at the sort of dominant forms of um, AI, then you can sort of see maybe three ways. So you have like in the earlier parts of the last century, like this dominance of rules-based systems. Um, and then, and, and they basically say, you know, you have hard-coded rules, often extremely sophisticated, which allow you to build sort of um, certain types of uh, AI systems. And by no means has this kind of um, part of AI research and uh, applications gone away. But at some point, you then had more these kind of learning systems emerge where you have like neural networks and deep uh, learning and other forms of learning, reinforcement learning, where you effectively use data to uh, construct part of the um, algorithm effectively, right? So the, the system learns from data rather than all the rules being prescribed. And if you look at what's now happening is we have these very powerful large language models and other types of um, uh, powerful AI models, but they by themselves um, are certainly now not not agentic in the sense that they, you know, there's some, some data which sits somewhere and then you effectively query these models, you instantiate them, you query them, and then you get a response and that can be a very sophisticated response, but that's it. Um, what What's interesting is once you think about um, effectively uh, systems that are having agency and can sort of autonomously uh, act. And there's an enormous pressure towards these systems from a pure optimization point of view and evolution point of view. Like if you think about it, where can you make the most money? Where are the most exciting applications as well? It's autonomous systems. Uh, which can take actions by themselves and then are, you know, maybe instructed by some third party, some human or, or some other system. And so, yeah, these kind of agentic systems, we, we can uncover a bit what, what they look like conceptually. Um, but that's, I think, where the train is headed, um, where, where a lot of focus is uh, going towards across like the AI fields. So David, maybe to kind of let me repackage this somewhat, would it be fair to say that an agentic system um, is something where you kind of give an AI agent a goal, but don't perfectly specify how it should, how it should go about achieving that? Or is that too simplistic? Yeah, I think um, that works. And in particular, I mean, what we are interested in are sort of these autonomous uh, agents. And so we can briefly define that sort of conceptually. So usually it's a sort of software system which is placed in some environment um, from which it perceives certain information. Um, you, they could be blockchain events, uh, literally, um, or they could be things from an API. Um, they could be something from a sensor, um, which it has locally. It then uh, uses that information plus whatever its internal architecture looks like to then take uh, action again in its environment. And that environment again can be like a blockchain, another API, uh, another agent, some actuator of any, any form. So this is what we would call like an autonomous agent. And effectively, what I'm saying is that what we're seeing increasingly is that there's more focus to basically create uh, models which can act as subsystems of such uh, autonomous agents or even like almost like subsume an autonomous agents as a whole, right? And so there's this kind of 
pressure um, towards these kind of systems. So as an example of an autonomous agent, maybe we could think of, um, so imagine there's a, there's the Gnosis network, and then there's the code base of the Gnosis network, and one could imagine like a coding agent of some kind where somebody opens an issue on against the code base of the Gnosis nation, a, or against the code base of the network. I want to add this feature to the core protocol of the Gnosis network. Then an agent could be something that kind of as a first step isolates the pieces of code that need to be changed. As a second step, creates code, uh, making those changes. As a third step, does some form of testing. So that could involve kind of like static analysis, but that could also involve like runtime analysis. Then gets feedback from the environment and then makes another set of changes and comes up with a draft like a draft change, a draft pull request. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think that's that's a good example. Um, also speaking of uh, Kinosis Chain, um, so one uh, autonomous agent which is running there, one type of autonomous agent which is built on the autonomous stack and is running there every day is a uh, agent which trades in prediction markets. And so if we kind of map that into this model which I was just describing, it might be quite helpful. So. Um, again, here, what it's observing are sort of uh, basically new markets um, opening. So it adds us to the list of markets, which it um, kind of has a look at. Um, it might then uh, fetch information um, pertaining to the events which are referenced in these markets from really anywhere in the web. Um, so a search API or just like um, crawling itself almost. It then um, uses that information, that context basically on the event, um, as well as um, various AI models. At the moment, most of the agents use some form of large language models um, to basically uh, prompt these models with that kind of information. And then once it arrives at a um, prediction for that event, um, together with an accuracy and other kind of information which it estimates, then um, sorry, a confidence which it, which it estimates, then um, it will construct a transaction and then sort of act in that market, i.e. kind of take a position in that market. So for instance, if it's a binary market, yes or no, um, by the relevant um, tokens which represent these events. And so here what you then have is this environment being sort of these smart contracts and the information uh, endpoints where which are pertaining to these markets and then the actions are these taking these positions in the markets and then some time passes and then the agent um, uh, might actually um, make some money oh okay but that sounds primarily like kind of like automation technology right so basically people wouldn't necessarily know that I run this sort of software to do things just like kind of I run for instance, say trading scripts right so um how how do we know that this is i mean i assume to some extent this is already happening um but kind of like wh where it gets really interesting is kind of when you kind of design um systems where several of these agents kind of come together to kind of um t t t t in, in a game theoretic um way to kind of figure out um is, you know, something to do, uh, s some conclusion or something, right? So yeah, a couple of things. So firstly, I think um, you're right that like there's sort of automation and then there's different levels of autonomy. And like, if you think about a self-driving car, they have these sort of levels. Um, and it's a bit similar to think here, like you have different kind of levels and you can be closer to what people might describe as automation. And then there's also this thing where as time moves on, um, we tend to prescribe things which maybe we saw as more autonomous towards automation because they kind of get wrapped behind like an agent, for instance, and then I can just sort of see the act of interacting with this agent where the agent is actually autonomous as for me, from, from the perspective of the user, it's almost like just like automation. I'm just calling this API, which then goes away and creates an outcome for me. And um, so I think there there's always... Um, that um but but you're right and then um 
in this system, which I was describing, actually the way it's practically implemented already is that there's already three types of agents um, today. So um, the trading agent itself doesn't actually come up with the prediction. It's other agents who specialize on that. Um, and now we're even like picking apart that role because um, what we basically see and is that from a practical perspective, um, if you can sort of specialize your agent um, that has its benefits, like the same way we specialize as humans. Um, um, but also um, from a sort of practical user's perspective of running the, the agent that can have its benefits. So for instance, if I had an agent which has to have all sorts of, um, let's say, open source model which needs to run alongside it, um, which it uses, then this can become quite um, a beast to actually run this thing, um, like pr quite impractical. Whereas if an agent can use other agents to get something done, then um, it might be as simple as making a small crypto payment to, for instance, get a prediction. And so that's the case here. And then you have to obviously trade that off um, with other design considerations of the system. So, like to state Friederike's question in like in different ways. So, any standard staking company would would be running, for example, price oracles, right? So, in 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 a price oracle, it's fetching the price from somewhere and submitting the price to the blockchain, and it's getting paid in crypto to to do that. And the one could imagine that entire. So it's like the. The code of like a price oracle is is highly mechanical. It can it is specified entirely in 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 a, in a programming language. The input to it is uh, very structured. It is probably coming as like JSON files that that are structured in a particular. And its output is also very structured. It is producing transactions that have these fields and etc. Perhaps that is like actually like an agent itself, except it's like a very dumb agent. And the kinds of agents you are thinking of are like AI agents where we are trying to climb the hierarchy of, well, the inputs no longer need to be that structured. It may, it may not come as JSON or, or protobuf or any of these protocols. It might come as an English language and it could be anything that comes in. So the inputs becomes unstructured. Then the processing logic, instead of being structured in the form of code, you could have processing logic where um, the agent, like de novo, comes up with how to execute on a certain input, and its execution path is kind of like invented for that particular input, and it might be different from what it was uh, what it was previously. And then finally, on the output side, its outputs could also be unstructured, meaning. It's it's producing output in, in terms of English language, which has like, of course, which English also has structure, which has like but less structure than uh, a, a programming language output or a JSON output would have. And so maybe the one way to think of it, the AI agent is we are trying to generalize the input, the processing and the output of what a, what is already kind of like uh, a traditional crypto agent. So validators, price oracles, we might think of them as traditional crypto agents, but we are trying to kind of push their boundaries in like what they can do. Yeah, and um, there's these different dimensions which you're kind of pointing at, right? So you have like the levels of autonomy um, and then the levels also of the kind of how dynamic is the decision-making, um, how open-ended um, is it, how structured and unstructured can be the input and output um, and basically like if you look at it from our perspective the way we look at it is um, our stack kind of allows you to build across a whole range of these things so uh, we have some uh, products which are very very structured so they're basically rules based uh, of the kind which you know an oracle is actually one example we, we you can build an oracle on our stack it's not like anyone is like majorly focused on it, but we have some demos of this sort. And then all, um, you know, you go a bit to the right on that dimension and then you add this um, prediction agent where it becomes a bit less structured because 
yes, some of the flow of it is entirely structured in the sense that it will always sort of do certain um, actions in a certain sequence. I'll get to that in a second as to how that's actually done on a code level. And then inside of these states, actually, let me explain it right now. It's like we structure this as sort of finite state machines. So basically we say, okay, the, the overall agent is described as this graph-like structure where it tra transverses through these states. And then in some of these states, it might um, sort of dynamically choose which path to take going forward, but sort of the rails are given, right? So it can't just sort of totally go off the rails and suddenly say, uh, I was a prediction agent now, and now I'm kind of doing this other thing, um, shopping clothes or whatever. <laughs> um, and this, um, we see this as a basically A, a pragmatic approach, and B, also a big advantage because, um, you know, obviously these kind of AI-enabled agents, autonomous agents, is something relatively uh, new in that form. Uh, they were stuck in this sort of doldrum for a long time where basically nothing much happened for, for decades in multi-agent systems research. I mean, no no sort of big um, move forward. And um, on the other hand, you now have these sort of AI agent models based mostly on large language models where it seems a lot is happening, but then when you dig a bit in, often if you leave them too unstructured, nothing it's an interesting research exercise but practically not too much happens so the sweet spot is still in between is what we say where you provide a certain degree of structure and then within certain states the agent can be uh, dealing with unstructured input or output and 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 could, can do what you were just describing um and that i think it's um you know how long we will be in this phase where it's so um and in between, I don't know, um, you know, there's certainly attempts to build sort of like almost like a large language model, but for actions where people sort of train this sort of um, in, in, into the model itself. Um, we'll have to see when, when they're actually, I think, usable. But if you want to use off the shelf technologies today, um, then you're sort of limited to still providing some degree of structure. The other way to look at this is also from an efficiency point of view. So once you actually know that your agent is meant to be an autonomous agent in prediction markets, that it's meant to make its money there, and that's that you want to use it for that, then it's kind of pointless is if every time it's running, it has to figure this out from first principles. That's a very dumb approach, right? It's the same way in, 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 in programming, if I write an efficient program, I might not generate everything dynamically. I might have like sort of hard coded, you know, lookup tables or whatever, where I just um, pull values out because it's way more efficient than if I were to generate them on the fly, even if I can. And so the same thing is here. Sometimes you might want to apply an agent actually at the building stage. So going back to what you were saying earlier, Meher, um, applying agents to build agents is also something we are focused on. So we have like some internal tooling now where we are able to basically prompt um, our tooling and then it gen generates um, sort of half of the agent. Like not all the code is finished. There's still like some software developer engagement needed, but it generates a lot of it. Um, so there's this angle as well from an efficiency point of view where you don't necessarily always want to figure out everything at runtime. You might want to sort of ahead of time build a better agent, which is then forced to um, act within these bounds given by um, that design. I'm still a little bit confused, kind of, as for the agent terminology. So um, I think kind of there's these cases where kind of I can imagine you kind of you have large games that you kind of you optimize for and kind of that means kind of you don't you don't have to do so much on chain because kind of you can optimize it off chain and kind of agents can keep each other in check right um and that to me is kind of like the multi-agent um system um at least in kind of my lay understanding um but kind of in in your description now it sounded like um what i would have conceptualized as one agent, you guys often think of as different agents that are somehow amalgamated together into kind of like a super agent. Um, as you said, kind of like there's the prediction, there's kind of the research agent and the prediction uh, making agent and so on. M maybe you can kind of 
um, delineate the, the terms here a little bit for us? Let me zoom out even like a bit further. So one of the, you know, uh, core things, which I guess like the idea of multi-agent systems is, is that you have multiple potentially different types of agents which generate some sort of emergent outcome. Um, so if you look at any individual of those agents, then they themselves wouldn't bring about this outcome. And then that's only the collection. So this is the example I was give, giving earlier, where you have these three types of agents, and then they kind of coming together and the outcome are sort of AI driven prediction markets where no human ever participates in. Now, if we look at our stack specifically, um, it gets um, a bit more interesting still, which is that we basically say, okay, going back to this idea of co-owned AI and co-owned uh, autonomous agents, like what motivates us there? Well, what motivates us is that we are a bit concerned that as there's this tremendous pressure to build better AI models and as there's this tremendous pressure to build better agentic uh, AI systems that ultimately they will be owned in a very centralized way and also operated in a very centralized way. And so the question is, can you create basically a substrate where people can own them in a decentralized way? So now one obvious answer is if you somehow can make a smart contract smarter. And there's a lot of uh, exciting projects which are kind of trying to do that with ZKML and other kind of uh, technological approaches where um, effectively you just uh, use a blockchain, a public one, and you run some code on it, uh, which might have been sort of verified uh, off-chain. Um, uh, sorry, verified on-chain, which might have been proved off-chain. Uh, off um, now... In our case, what we offer is basically, okay, if you want to build an autonomous agent and you then want to run that code as a decentralized system, then you can do that. So in the OLA stack, you can develop this trader agent, which I mentioned earlier, um, and you then can run it as a multi-node system. So what basically happens is that the trader agent is like the, the whole of all these agent nodes. And here it's a bit different because these agent nodes are effectively like blockchain nodes that are sort of replicating um, the the work and also the code. Um, they're you know often quite identical or can even be fully identical uh, instances of each other, and then they work together to effectively become the trader agent. And so on chain they're represented as a multisig, and uh, off chain there's this couple of nodes which have like. Uh, state synchronization between them. So very practically, what they use is Tendermint um, at the moment as a consensus gadget so that all the nodes in the system agree um, on the actions this uh, agent should take next. So in the field of LLMs itself, right? Like, And now I'm referring to, let's say, like the non-crypto part of building on top of LLMs, which is probably a thousand times bigger than the the crypto part. There's like lots of different frameworks that are kind of like building agents um, using LLMs. So Langchain is probably the most commercially successful, but then you'll go and find like Microsoft Autogen, which, which is a multi-agent system uh, in, in how it's constructed. But there are, but there are like loads of others. In fact, they, in fact, the problem is, is it's a problem of plenty uh, rather than a problem of uh, problem of scarcity. So maybe to start with, in terms of like the agent framework you are building, uh, what is like really different about your agent framework from the things that might be happening outside crypto as a as a whole? Yeah, I think one. Key thing is that we always um, want system which are sort of able to take action on chain like any other users. Um, so we see like autonomous agents as these sort of daily active users of various protocols. And we can talk about this uh, later in a bit, what benefits that has for the protocol. But that means that um, in our case, sort of the crypto wallet and also the on-chain representation of the off-chain agent are like first-class citizens. So we think of this from the design um, beginning and then that has implications 
for instance, when we come back to this trader, if I want to co-own, like, let's say a long chain agent, um, well, you'd have to basically build what we've built, um, because you need some way of basically sharing ownership of, let's say an on-chain wallet, like a, a safe, let's say, a multi-sig, um, with these off-chain instances of agents. So our, our framework lets you do this. That's, that's one way to look at it. So it's just a sort of native, um, crypto support, I guess. Um, the second thing is this, if you go further to co-ownership, there's sort of two extremes there again. Um, so if co-ownership can be achieved entirely on chain, so for instance, you have like a safe, which has some assets, and now you have a lot of, let's say land chain agents or auto GPT agent or whatever, uh, one of those framework agents, uh, all kind of holding a wallet and then, um, being a signer on the safe, then this could work, right? Because they don't necessarily need off-chain consensus, depending on what the application is. But actually, once you look into the interesting application, turns out that almost always, once you go beyond like simple things which are done on-chain, uh, you need off-chain consensus because often it's like things like oh, like even an oracle needs to agree off-chain potentially on the data it wants to put on-chain. Um, certainly, efficient oracles want to do that off-chain. Um, and then if you imagine this off-chain system wanting to act upon something else off-chain, then for sure you also need off-chain consensus. So there it then also again helps to have a stack which gives you this out of the box, which I was this. Now, a third way to look at it, and this is sort of purely on the independent of crypto and more sort of on the structuring of the agent, is that um, coming back to our discussion earlier, automation versus autonomy and like sort of fully um, AI based and dynamic uh, um, 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 uh, agent systems rather than those which are maybe like sort of based on hard coded rules. The reality is if you want to build like really use cases which can use people, which people can use today and which are actually meaningfully and securely achieving something then you can't go yet uh, in these sort of fully unstructured models where you just basically repeatedly prompt an LLM. Like you can do it, but it's it doesn't work. I mean, you need to provide structure. And then if you look at the frameworks, you know, Langchain is an interesting example. And, and um, you know, I have no, um, no uh, nothing bad to say about it, but it's an interesting example. They're moving towards graph structures as well because it's pretty obvious that a chain won't cut it. Like your decision making is almost never a chain. That is the most basic kind of application where it's like A, B, C, D, and then going back to A, right? The reality is you're going to have, even in the most basic application, you're going to have the happy path, which might look like this. But then off the happy path, you have all these error paths, which need to sort of loop back to different states. And so you're basically in a graph structure. Um, and so that's where we started our journey. We, we basically like, five years ago said, well, if you're building uh, autonomous agent systems, then it's unlikely that we're going to have in the short term, these sort of fully open-ended um, sort of just models, which we need to train or somehow the agentic uh, system pops out. But um, instead, we still need to provide some rails and then use um, models um, alongside those rails. And these rails in our case are these basic graphs along which the agent has to travel. And now, if you put it back all together, I think one of the benefits you have of our stack is that you can go and say, okay, I have a, a use case where there's some um, states in which the agent is very free. There's other states where I want the agent to just travel along this track. Then I can do this. And now I also want this agent to take um, action on chain um, uh, ever so often Then it already comes out of the box. Um, so we obviously, from the beginning, when we built the framework, were really um, heavy users of the safe. So we had like Ethereum support with safe since basically day one, since the framework is usable. And now as we're sort of expanding it um, to other sort of types of um, uh, uh, blockchain ecosystems, um, we're always kind of having the same design paradigm again, where we pick like a multisig, um, which is dominant in this ecosystem, and then build... Um, the compatibility of the stack around it. Okay, I think I'm I'm now less confused about the agentic part. 
Um, but I'm still confused about kind of like the protocol as a whole. So kind of like if you look at the stack, now now we kind of have some understanding of what these agents can and can't do. I can't just give an agent, I don't know, I can't just say, here you have 100 die, you make me some money. Um, and basically the, the agent will go and kind of like uh, either kind of like, bar, bar, you know, build an arbitration bot or kind of... Um, make saucy pictures on middle uh, on mid journey and kind of put them on only fans and i mean so basically it's like it's like you have to give it some structure i understand that now but how do you put this all into a protocol and kind of where does the co-ownership come in because this is something that in principle with an llm mod model and like some uh, dev background i could just do on my own right i don't need autonomous for that yeah, and um, that's a great question. So basically, I think for like one of our core insights is that it's not about building individual agents. It's about building effectively uh, many ag agentic systems which can interact um, because ultimately we're like big believers in the specialization and even like from a very practical point of view, if you want to build better agents, the people will build very different agents. So the framework will have to cater very different sort of use cases. So the protocol was always designed to um, enable basically entire agent economies and enable their bootstrapping. So there is a couple of mechanisms which uh, facilitate that. The stack itself is open source. So when you have an open source stack, there's never a forcing function to tell some, oh, you have to use this protocol. Um, so you have to basically create like a, a reason on top where why it would make sense for people to engage with this protocol. So one thing which we noticed is if we want to have these basically autonomous agent use cases really grow, then we need obviously a lot of uh, development, um, you know, developers who build uh, on the stack. Why do developers have the benefit of building on the stack? Well, there's some of the technical reasons we mentioned before, but there's also one of composability. So we basically have created um, a very composable framework um, where it's not so much about composing arbitrary Python libraries, which is a focus of a lot of the other frameworks, but where it is the focus of the stack to compose business logic itself. Um, and that's particularly with autonomous agents of the current generation, if you think about it, it's very important. So if I have like, for instance, this trader, and at some point it's gonna settle a transaction, um, you might say, well, that is just a matter of sending the transaction. Well, this is actually not true. There's around like 20 or 30 uh, states in the finite state machine, which takes care of settling the transaction. Because there is like on the happy path, various things that you need to come, you need to sign it from all the agents. You need to then submit it. You don't need to wait for it to be settled. Um, and if anything goes wrong in any of those states, the resolution looks different. Um, now, you don't want a developer to re-implement that. Similarly, if you think about things like um, uh, interacting with these prediction markets, that might actually be like something which you might want in another agent. So being able to kind of compose these things is, is, is very, very interesting. And so one big part of the protocol as a result is this focus on creating a developer mechanism, developer incentive mechanism, whereby developers get rewards for contributing these pieces of agents and entire agents uh, into the stack. Um, so that's the code side of things. Um, they can do that permissionlessly. So very practically, um, you, you know, you develop the stuff, you uh, uh, register it on chain as these NFTs, and then there's a sort of reward system which works sort of on, a, on an epoch basis. Um, on the other side of this is, um, is the question of capital. So um, obviously the developer rewards come partially from, you know, emissions, but over the longer term, they will have to come from productive agent systems, which the DAO kind of operates. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but even to get you there, um, basically you need a, a bootstrapping mechanism whereby the people can actually use this um, OLAS token. And so that's where bonding comes in. So whenever the protocol is deployed on a new chain, then effectively 
Um, there's a bonding mechanism in place whereby um, people who use or believe in the protocol can provide liquidity um, in this uh, token and the chains token, and then return that LP token to the protocol and receive uh, effectively uh, all us. And what this does is that basically you have a very decentralized way of bringing that utility token to more chains. Why do you want it on more chains? Because that's the third bit, which is staking. So once I obviously have like code, which does something useful, um, now I want to be able to actually operate these agents. And as we noted before, you can operate them like a decentralized system. So it ends up looking a bit like operating uh, a blockchain. So you effectively then have the staking system where the operators of the nodes in any given agent um, can basically earn these uh, uh, staking rewards. Um, and in order for that to all be smooth, it helps when the token is basically accessible on that chain directly. So that's sort of the three mechanisms, like staking being the last, and then the, the code capital sort of um, uh, pair. And then we can dive in there if you want. Yeah, so actually that's a lot of things, right? So let's try to recap. So right at the layer of building the agent, um, what you're saying is like, okay, your framework, in a sense, like there are many frameworks which we can can be used to build agents, but the the differentiation of the autonomous framework is that it contains the differentiation is, is in on two dimensions. The first dimension is it contains components that would make blockchain integration and blockchain transaction uh, creation easy. So this could it, this could involve things like, okay, a blockchain, an agent, if it needs to interact with a blockchain, it needs to store a private key. So maybe it it needs some components for the securing of private keys. It needs components by which it can read blockchain data. It, it needs components by which transactions can be sent and it can, it can figure out that they were confirmed or not. So there are like some standard pieces of uh, logic that are used in a lot of different places. Maybe even exchanges use it in their hot wallet or, or things like that. And you're, you're gonna build like the standard versions of those components and integrate them into your framework so a developer doesn't have to worry about those aspects. Then the second thing your framework's providing is, it is providing some kind of cognitive architecture. What By that, what, what we might mean is that um, you want the agent to basically apply its intelligence, but you want it to you want to constrain its intelligence in a certain manner, which is like you know for for, for a particular problem, always think, always create a tree and reason through the nodes of a tree. Or in this particular problem, um, create a line and like there are nodes and reason through all of these nodes. So particular problems might have particular ways of thinking that if we constrain the agent to think in that particular way, it will produce better outputs. And so you are you are providing a way to develop against some of these um, of these like constraints, right? Like so, a developer can put these constraints into their system, and then they could um, they could use it. Those are on the framework itself. And then what you're saying is actually like the the network itself. So so now we jump from like the framework deals with the problem of how do you build a single agent or how do you build maybe two or three agents and they coordinate with each other. But then you jump to the network level where it's the problem of ultimately you want thousands of agents to be to be built. And there the kinds of problems you are trying to solve are how to provide developer incentives for the improvement of your agent framework itself. Yeah, so this is so if we zoom out a bit, what we ultimately want is a machine to well, even if we zoom out a bit more. So the co ownership of autonomous um, agents and agentic AI ends up being, I think, what if you think about like 
DAO, like decentralized autonomous organization, is sort of almost like the end state um, of that. So if you if you think about this concept of like some organization which we own, which is in itself uh, autonomous and which has the highest degree of decentralization we can achieve, then ultimately this will be using forms of AI and and be agentic, right? By by its definition, and so the different angle at which to come at this is to say, okay, how how can you basically coordinate all the actors which need to make that happen, right? Because if it's just on-chain, then you're always constrained by what you can do on-chain, right? So if you just have a smart contract, then there's always someone who has to call that smart contract for something to happen. And by necessity, you will always be limited to what's possible on-chain, which I think will always be less than what's possible off-chain. And so in a way, the, the other way to look at it is to say, how can you create basically a protocol, autonomous, which allows the creation of these kind of co-ownable autonomous agents? And then this means you need to coordinate a bunch of actors. You need to coordinate those who are developing them. That's why you have the death incentive mechanism. You need those who uh, operate them, which is around staking. And you need those who basically uh, provide this... Um, liquidity for the whole system to exist at any given point, which is the bonders. And so that's kind of what the roles of the protocol is, is to coordinate all these actors. Now, obviously, it's highly uh, complex, so we should make it a bit um, concrete. If you think about um, what we had earlier um, discussed quite a lot, the, the trading agent use case with the prediction markets, um, then there's the system called uh, the MEX inside of it, um, which is this third type of agent, which basically just specializes on making the predictions. And these kind of um, agents um, are basically something which you can imagine running as this decentralized system, which the autonomous DAO itself then can own. So you effectively then have a situation where the autonomous DAO can provide on an ongoing basis this kind of off-chain system with configurable deg degrees of decentralization, which offers these services to other agents in the uh, autonomous ecosystem. And then that allows you to sort of um, bootstrap this over time. That makes sense. Can I think of it like this, that so today we have a few different chains that are trying to build what I call like puppet accounts or delegated account control. Uh, those are those are two like two interchangeable words, but the essential idea behind it is so so the near network is trying to build this. Okay, so so near's idea is that okay, there's a blockchain with a sort of with a set of validators, and what if this blockchain itself could own a Bitcoin address, not only a Bitcoin address but another Ethereum address, and so from from the perspective of Bitcoin, it's like a normal address with a private key, but the private key is actually split into the validator set of near by some really smart cryptographic protocol. So Bitcoin thinks this is like a single, it's a normal address, a single individual, but in reality underneath it is actually the validator set of near that controls that account. And in a sense that you can say that, okay, that, that the near network by itself is kind of like owning this, owning this address on Bitcoin and this other address on, on Ethereum. If you start with that point and then, and then kind of, kind of you layer on the idea that, is it possible that, okay, that there'd be a way by which a network could own not only an address, but an address plus a piece of like, running code and that running code is one an, an economic agent which, uh, that running code is an autonomous this framework agent so it has an address and it has some kind of like uh, structured and unstructured logic so you can actually message it give it tasks and expect responses and so autonomous is trying to do that ultimately like how do you have a DAO that can own an address plus some kind of code? And so, and it, it, it owns both of those components together. 
and then it can also sort of sort of like make money make money through it that that is what you're what you're seeking to achieve well this this is yeah so we would call this like a protocol on top so it's basically if we go back to this um uh, concept which you said earlier if you have an existing validator set so you, basically you could say okay well let's just do this all uh, on chain you know like let's just somehow modify the chain so it can sort of run long running tasks and then you will find very quickly that there's all these arguments as to why that cannot work like you need an application specific chain in order to have long running tasks because if you have a public chain it becomes an immediate um basically ad hack vector for for denial of service um distribute denial of service because you can just sort of preempt future blocks indefinitely by scheduling tasks for future blocks now. So effectively, whatever Nier is doing there, I don't know in too much detail, but there's limits to um, kind of putting too much on a block public blockchain, which is meant to run repeatedly um, or scheduled, basically. So you need to do it on some sort of application specific layer. And now you could say, okay, well, we can just run some sort of layer two or layer three or layer N or whatever. Um, and ultimately there, it's mostly about having sort of, again, an architecture where you can basically then inherit some degree of security, right? And in, uh, execute some of those instructions. And in a way, um, I think ultimately, you know, in, in, in the future one day, an autonomous service will look uh, quite similar similar to an app specific rollout potentially because it will basically have a lot of degrees of verifiability um, and it will potentially even inherit some of the security um, uh, as a result from the chains on which it acts but um, it will have these more autonomous a long running um, tasks here uh, which is executing which is different from like a public blockchain where I always need to basically at any given time offer these blocks which accept a certain amount of basically bidding into them and then once they're full they're full right i can't guarantee you that i'll execute you whereas an autonomous service can do that it can say well i'm application specific uh ever so often i'm doing exactly this thing okay so um i feel like this has become super abstract um may maybe let's kind of make some examples, right? So one of um, the main topics that kind of you posit this will be used for um, in the short term is um, optimization of DAOs. Um, can you give us some examples how kind of things work in DAOs today and how you see them improving by kind of putting these um, autonomous agent systems on top of them or kind of enmeshing them? Yeah, so actually there's a nuance to this question even in the sense that originally we thought when we started out with the stack that like DAOs are this primary customer for that, right? They have various off-chain processes which are often quite centralized that help them make them more decentralized um, and more autonomous, um, both things which are in the name. Turns out from a go-to-market point of view, um, it's not particularly great because a lot of DAOs have actually a lot of things to do and they're maybe not the best organized uh, entities always. And so it takes a lot of time and you, you're not getting uh, to the goal very fast. You also need to coordinate a lot of actors by the definition of it. Um, so actually what we noticed is that what's, um, whilst we still believe in this, and I'll talk about an example, is that it's better to focus on problems we see in our own DAO and make them as autonomous and decentralized and or just build basically users for other decentralized protocols. So what I mentioned earlier, the use case, these autonomous agents are basically users of Omen, users of Gnosis, users of SAFE. You know, they have done um, around 70% of all SAFE transactions on Gnosis since summer, um, like on a, on, a, on a weekly basis, basically. They've done hundreds of thousands of transactions, which basically benefit these protocols on which they're deployed. And obviously themselves as well because they're they're profitable. Um, now, an example which I like um, because it's very easy to understand, um, which can apply to many DAOs and which they can adopt quite easily, is Governator. It was a bit of a joke project which is sort of uh, slowly maturing, 
basically it's built on the uh, autonomous service stack, which which Olas offers autonomous. Um, what it does is it's, it basically replaces a human uh, delegate T in, in a DAO. So if I obviously have tokens and I don't always want to vote, I could delegate them to someone I think will vote more or vote in my favor, like um, with my intent and so on. And uh, we implemented that in code. So basically there's an autonomous service which continuously watches those DAOs for which it holds delegated tokens. And then when it sees those proposals either on snapshot or on chain, it can then vote um, in those proposals. And obviously in order to do that, it needs to use um, a large language model to actually read the proposal and reason about it. Um, it also needs that in order to make sense of the preferences it has given and sort of bring those two things together to arrive at a voting decision. But the actual voting coming back to the structured versus unstructured is a very structured process. There's zero point in having the agent figure this out every time because it will probably fail most of the time. Instead, you just have that part hard-coded, right? So basically, this is a nice example of what we were discussing about earlier in very abstract ways. You have these sort of structured bits which are defined very well. And then you have these uh, unstructured parts of, of the logic where uh, you're looking at these proposals, making sense of it, and so on. Are there new attack vectors that are introduced here? So basically, if if I kind of um, if I kind of trust um, an autonomous agent to kind of make voting decisions for me, I kind of I rely heavily on the fact that um, this autonomous agent actually um, will act in the way that I would act if I were to look into it, right? So how, how do you make sure that the agents actually do what they are meant to do on the face of it? That's a great question. So the there's two parts to this, well, many, but I would split it into um, one is like the preferences. So that's where the governators fall short. It doesn't actually allow you to express very um, rich preferences at all. And that's just a, a matter of our time and uh, effort, which has gone into this part of the application. But one side where it exceeds on is the um, basically certainty that it implements the decisions, the decision logic, which it is meant to implement. So if you think about a human, if you delegate to them, you basically have no clue, right? It's all reputation based. If you were to think to delegate to a single long chain agent or auto GPT agent, well, it really depends on the developer who is running that. Are they even running it? If they're running it, are they running the code they told you they're running, right? All this kind of stuff. Whereas with an autonomous service, which has multiple nodes operated by different operators, you then start getting into a similar, basically, threat model, which you have with like a, you know, like your Cosmos chain, basically, or any other uh, sort of um, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, system, whereby you have to reason about, okay, how many like operators are there, how decentralized is it, and then um, is the majority of them honest. If the majority of them is honest, um, then you have uh, very high security guarantees because you effectively, what happens is that each one of them has to agree or the majority of them has to agree and each one of them uses these models so you're not even relying on a single model instance, which is another issue with large language models. They're not necessarily deterministic at all. They sometimes can be configured to be, but like um, some of them can't even uh, be configured to be deterministic. Um, so then having multiple agents each come to independent valuations and then sort of pool that decision-making and then agree is actually like um, a massive improvement. So on that dimension, I would say Governet is already better than a human because a human could you know, do whatever. And here you have like a node system implementing that decision logic. Yeah. So I think kind of w what we often try to do in these episodes is kind of, we try to understand how exactly things work. And I think this was more an episode about kind of talking about why it would make sense to have something like this. So kind of, I kind of, I know I want to change gears a little bit here um, and kind of um, ask about concerns you may have about this. So kind of like, um, if you look at AIs, the way that they have improved in the last couple of years, at least kind of like in, in the popular um, mind, I know that kind of, it's been a long a time coming and so on, but it's really impressive, right? 
it seems absolutely certain that they will kind of surpass uh, human ingenuity and, you know, capacity on all kinds of axes in, you know, the very short term. And if you talk to AI safety people, um, kind of often they will tell you um, they're not so concerned because you can always switch it off. And now kind of pairing it with a technology that by definition, no one can turn off. Does that worry you? Yeah, I think it's a, a good topic to discuss and one we will, will not be um, obviously certain about. Um, I think the the first thing which I strongly believe in is that it's very, very, very unlikely that there will be just sort of one model which kind of runs away and like takes over. And that's just um, even in like very favorable cases to the sort of um, super intelligence arising and being able to consume a lot of resources, um, there is like geographical, physical sort of constraints which make it unlikely. Um, I think what's much more likely is that it that we'll have a situation where certainly a lot of centralized players will own very very powerful uh, models, and so I think actually what we should be most concerned about is um, the economic impact of this kind of change in technology on people, rather than these hypotheticals where some software slays us all. I think it you know it's not. It's important to kind of keep it in the back of our minds, but and and like with every technology, be mindful as to when these dangers become more apparent that we kind of think about them. But like the the much much bigger concern, I think, is you know economic uh, on the economics. If you if you hit the hit uh, listen to someone like Sam Altman, it's this naivety of the economics which really riles me up. Like they all go around and say, you know, I mean, they, you know, by all means, like they're great, like, you know, entrepreneurs and great, great products and so on, but everyone has their weak points. I think here it's like this kind of naivety around just because I create better technology, everyone will be better. Well, that never worked out that way. The reality is that it's always a distribution question. And if the distribution sucks of access to these kind of models and um, people's ability to use them for their lives and improving their own situation, then it doesn't matter how good the best model is, then there will still be even bigger disparities in sort of income, health, wealth uh, around the globe. And I think that's what we should all be really worried about. And that's kind of the mission of our entire business and the mission of Autonomous is about creating these kind of systems which can be co-owned so that there can be groups who can share these uh, systems. That doesn't mean that all problems are solved because now you know these groups could again be better off than others and you still have these kind of distributional issues but at least it's it's a start so i'm worried about the economic impact of this much 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 more than these kind of hypotheticals um, which i think are interesting for dinner conversations but really don't kind of miss the point mostly um having said that i think you know let's say we fast forward there's like multiple generations of advances and like um even like models, which are basically agent in the model, sort of, you know, like some call them large action models now I saw and the others call them differently. Then, you know, uh, OpenAI has their um, reinforcement learning merged with um, uh, large language models. There's different attempts, whatever it will be in the ultimate state. And um, if we imagine that to run in a sort of blockchain like way um, where it sort of has a bad intent and we can't turn it off yes i think it's something we should keep in the back of our mind and and think um about solutions but i think the flip side of this is um again that if this model is used for good then having transparency and um uh kind of censorship resistance can bring many uh goods as well so I think let's take it one step at a time, basically, and focus on the problems which we for sure know will happen, which I think are distributional. I feel like we've touched on many, many things. If people want to learn more or kind of build um, their own ag uh, agentic systems um, for autonomous or kind of just use 
um, systems that are already there. Um, where where should we send them? Yeah, so we have this thing called the Academy. Um, that's a great start. Um, so that's for uh, people who want to basically have more like support as they're building. We have the docs. All of that can be found on the website, so olas.network. And then if you uh, follow uh, Autonolas on Twitter as well, there's like weekly updates um, where I think those two places are, are the best. Perfect. Um, I am so curious to see how this is uh, going to evolve. I think uh, we should pencil in kind of a follow-up uh, soonish um, to just to see kind of like what people build and kind of um, how it actually changes things because the opportunity space here is absolutely enormous. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being on.